I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on the state of security techniques for managing risk. I'm going to hand things over to our cybersecurity product manager, Mr. Buck Chell. Thank you, Kelly, and hello, everyone. I'm Buck Chell, as Kelly introduced. I'm the cybersecurity product manager at the New Horizons corporate office, and I'd also like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is going to be the first out of 10 cybersecurity focused webinars that New Horizons is hosting in the month of October. October has been designated by the US federal government, Department of Homeland Security as National Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which is now in its 15th year as an annual campaign to raise awareness about the importance of cybersecurity. The goal of New Horizons Cybersecurity Awareness Month webinars, which are done in conjunction with our industry partners, is to provide you with a better understanding of how to stay safer online with input from subject matter experts to help enhance your organization's cyber resilience and overall cybersecurity posture. The 10 cybersecurity webinars that New Horizons is hosting this month cover different aspects about today's ever-evolving threat landscape. And today we're going to delve into the state of security and techniques for managing risks. And I would like to introduce today's presenter, who is a subject matter expert, Dr. James Stanger, who is the Chief Technology Evangelist at TopTIA. Dr. Stanger is a respected authority concerning network, authority, network security, web technologies, and open source. He has designed and taught both traditional and online courses, and as an active security consultant, he has spoken and delivered training worldwide for over 20 years. His particular areas of security expertise involve penetration testing, firewall configuration, intrusion detection, incident response. He has acted as a security consultant for various entities, including the United States Department of State, uh, BYU, uh, Securify, purchased by McAfee, the Association for Corporate Counsel. He is currently the Chief Technology Evangelist for CompTIA, where he serves as a developer and advocate for their certifications. Over the years, he's designed certifications and curricula for CIW, the University of California Riverside, Semantic IBM, and the Telephony Industry Association. He's an award-winning author and blogger. Dr. Stinger has written titles for O'Reilly Media, Prentice Hall, IBM, Cybex. His writings have been translated into over a dozen languages. And he's presented at various forums, including regular webcasts. Um, I could go on, but... Um, Without further ado, I think we're just going to get started, and I'm going to turn this over to Dr. James Stanger. You now have the floor. Well, thank you so much, Buck. I appreciate it, and thank you so much, Kelly. Hey, welcome, everybody. Uh, just to make sure you can hear me, if everybody could uh, just chime in and say uh, where you're calling in from. I'm calling in from Seattle, Washington, up in the Pacific Northwest. You should be seeing my little screen there that says the state of security, and that's a picture of the Rogue River. I was just swimming in that here about a about a month and a half ago, uh, not in that, not in those rapids there. That would be that would that would end badly. Uh, but I was just swimming above them. I guess that's a bit risky, but that's all right. We're here to talk about techniques for managing risk. So it sounds like uh, everybody's uh, able to listen in. Let's go ahead. Uh, I've already. Uh, uh, Buck has done an incredible job introducing me. I, I, uh, I'm humbled by that. Um, uh, there's uh, some of the places that, as I've talked to IT professionals around the world, there's some of the places where I've gone. Uh, me waving at you there uh, in the scuba gear, that was in Scotland. And then in England there, uh, that was a place called Helvellyn, which is a really cool mountain. Yeah, it's a little risky to walk up it, but it was tons of fun. Today, we're going to be talking about the insights that we've gathered at CompTIA about the evolving attack threat landscape, about the defender's dilemma, and why um, I've little, been a little extreme there in stating how it's not a useful perspective. It's useful, but it has limitations, let's put it that way. And we're going to talk about something called the attacker's dilemma, how we can change our perspective, and how that can help us better place security controls such as detection systems, intrusion detection systems, uh, uh, response methodologies, how it can help apply um, SIM tools, better things like that. Then we're going to talk a bit about how to organize or maybe reorganize a business to derive ma maximum benefit and control risk. Well, let's talk about what the threat landscape is looking like, seeing as how we're kind of kicking off uh, the New Horizons 
uh, series of webinars about uh, cybersecurity for this month. And again, thank you very much, uh, 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 New Horizons, for uh, allowing us here at CompTIA to, to join in. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, the ever-evolving la landscape, as people have been talking to me, and I've been, gee, I was just in Japan a while back, and I, uh, 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 the UK, Europe, uh, uh, kind of been all over. And the, the themes have been strong in talking about the different types of issues that we run into. And the first one here I've got listed is fileless threats. I saw that uh, those open filing cabinets, that nice image off the internet, I thought that was very clever. Um, what's happening, folks, is that traditionally malware is something that was introduced using some for sort of file. Uh, sounds pretty obvious. But the idea is that uh, through social engineering, some sort of file um, gets presented to an end user via email, via chat, you get the idea. Maybe even a web link through some form of social engineering. And, and this file <clears throat> is, a, is a bad file, right? It's got malware in it. It's a, a ransomware. It's Petya or not Petya, uh, to use a, a basic example. It's some sort of file. What's, what's happening more and more in the ransomware world, in the malware world, are something, is something called fileless threats. It's been around for a good year or more. Well, it's been around forever, but it's really become very strong over the last year or so, uh, maybe even a couple. Fileless threats, and it's the concept where hackers live off the land, and they use built-in features of the operating system. Uh, for those of you who use uh, Windows, uh, PowerShell, it's built in. It's very powerful. It is very useful, and it can be used for good and for ill. Uh, interpreters that are built in. If you have a Linux system, for example, and Python happens to be installed for whatever reason, either because it was part of a default install or the, the Linux server was, is, part of a, um, is part of a series of servers that use Python, a uh, great, great uh, uh, language, uh, to serve up web pages or to do some sort of business function. The idea is that instead of having to bring in an already pre-compiled piece of malware that antivirus systems are likely to find, you live off the land and use in the built-in features and the built-in uh, uh, macros, et cetera, built-in built tools of various systems. And that way the hacker can go in and start creating havoc. And so macros that are in Word docs or, or various documents, browser features. And so the idea is that hackers have various strategies and tactics for using these fileless threats. So they basically are able to uh, uh, use simple programs or not so simple programs and create them right on the fly. Uh, and they oftentimes, these uh, gangs of hackers, uh, are basically people who have persistence strategies ready to go. They're ready to use PowerShell or they're ready to use some form of uh, uh, interpreter to mess with the registry or to activate uh, RDP, uh, uh, Remote uh, Desktop Protocol and basically get in that way. So that's a, a major way in which it's happening. And here is an example uh, that I grabbed of somebody creating a very simple PowerShell script, and they're able to uh, basically, uh, they're, they're searching around and seeing if they can find a particular printer uh, driver issue and then exploit it that way. We're also seeing uh, malware. Uh, yeah, ransomware has been around for a long time. I was just uh, here a couple of months ago in um, Colorado talking to the CIO, CISO um, of uh, the entire state of Colorado, and she was talking about how they were able to get past a malware uh, outbreak. Uh, thankfully, because she, ha about a year, year and a half before, had gotten a backup strategy going for the entire state of Colorado. She called it uh, Backup Colorado. Uh, and that's how she was able to get out of the mess that happened, where basically for a two-week period, all of the systems for the, for the police, I believe it was, and definitely for uh, the highway systems, people who maintain the highways, were completely down. We're also seeing malware, uh, excuse me, crypto jacking malware. And that's basically a variant of ransomware, which is, of course, is still a major problem. Uh, no one is seriously arguing that ransomware is going away, but crypto jacking has gotten big. Uh, and it's basically introduced through social engineering, uh, through software weaknesses, and basically where people inject software that instead of taking over the system and then saying, hey, I'll give you your system back for X Bitcoin, a amount of Bitcoin, or X amount of dollars, or rubles, or whatever. What they're doing is they're silently installing this uh, crypto jacking malware that uh, onto your company's systems. Uh, 
and then basically deriving benefit by your systems, uh, GPUs and CPUs, mining Bitcoin, Ethereum, you get the idea. And so this is a lot lower risk for a lot of these attackers because the attackers, in a sense, most of these attackers these days aren't all that interested necessarily in taking over your system. That's, that's not the goal. They just want money from you. They want to generate revenue just like any corporation. And so they ask themselves, well, do we want to get into this situation where there's a, <clears throat> a high risk uh, scenario? Do I really want to install ransomware? Uh, that is very obvious, that tells you, hey, pay up or you lose your systems. Um, lots of things can go wrong. They can get caught during the money exchange, even though they use anonymous techniques and, and try to use Bitcoin or other things that are harder to trace. But there is still that risk that people won't pay the ransom or risk that in paying the ransom, the bad guy gets caught. So the bad guy says to themselves, well, how about if we install a bunch of software all over a company and the company may not even notice or if they do notice they don't it's not a real high priority and they can still generate revenue and this is one thing i'll take the opportunity to talk about while we're talking about crypto jacking um today's hacker for a long time has not been the hoodie wearing shadowy figure i i still see as I'm going up to YouTube to listen to my favorite Zeppelin album or whatever, I, I often see these ads about the, you know, the, the dun, 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 the hacker. And sorry, guys, it, it's not the shadowy teenager or whatever. These people uh, look a lot like you and me, and sometimes they are you and me, certainly not me. Um, but they're people who ha work for organizations, these hackers. They, they have time off and benefits and, and they have lives and they just happen to be doing illicit things like helping install crypto jacking malware into your system. So today's hacker profile is somebody who would look relatively corporate and belongs to a corporation and, uh, in a sense. And uh, it's very interesting. Okay, crypto jacking malware, the main way that you can detect that is by looking at process monitoring. Of course, antivirus will help and all that, but CPU and GPU uh, usage, uh, crypto jacking malware, or, or <clears throat> I know a lot about blockchain, blockchain oriented software tends to use that GPU a lot, uh, the graphics processing unit as well as the CPU. And the way that it is introduced is through social engineering. Um, and uh, these are just examples here of systems that we've been, I've been able to look at. Um, and we notice, well, it's kind of obvious sometimes when crypto jacking malware gets installed. I mean, notice the, um, uh, the, C, uh, the CPU uh, uh, usage there and the IO going way up. Uh, a lot of times this is done, uh, uh, this is installed through, oh, hey, we got an update for your browser. Notice where it says Chrome is updating. Uh, that particular page there is actually installing the malware. You know, another problem that we're seeing that over the threat landscape uh, here is the software development lifecycle. And this is not where I'm trying to point the, the finger completely at software developers, the hardworking folks and all that sort of thing. Um, they are. Uh, uh, but here's the deal. Uh, corporations, both large corporations that make our operating systems or open source movement uh, or, or software developers that work for a small company using, say, Python or PHP or whatever to create a web app <clears throat> are part of a major ongoing issue. Few companies are taking the time to apply enough eyes and methods from a security standpoint to get past the fact that we've got a lot of buggy software out there. We don't have multi-factor authentication in our processes for developing software. Um, it's kind of the wild, wild west out there. Uh, it's like 1995 again. These are phrases that I heard when I was at RSA San Francisco here this past uh, March, April. Um, where I was talking to a bunch of folks about blockchain uh, and about uh, uh, not necessarily Bitcoin or Ethereum, but blockchain implementations. And the software that is being used, for example, for blockchain um, is good software, sure. But notice that uh, we've seen uh, attack after attack of, on blockchain, not necessarily against the blockchain protocol, but against the software that is used to implement the protocol. In other words, we have really good, uh, I'll draw an analogy, we have really good uh, transport layer security, TLS, right? It's in its third iteration. Um, what we're, uh, and, and it's, I'm not saying it's hack proof, but it's pretty good. We're seeing 
the advent of a lot of software through mobile phones, through uh, implementations of blockchain and everything, that basically is not developed with a lot of due care. Why? Because it's rushed out to market. We're seeing Internet of Things devices that have been put out uh, uh, into the world that have a full Linux stack on them, a baby monitor. Why would you install a full Linux stack of software with all of that capability on a baby monitor? Why wouldn't you, you know, cripple that Linux stack a bit so that it just does one job and does it well? Well, the reason is, is we rush things to market because we're, you know, corporations have to make money and we can't take forever, James. We can't make things 100% secure because costs would go too high. So there's a serious problem in our software development lifecycle. Uh, and it's not just IoT devices. It's not just blockchain software. It's across the board. And we're not, uh, we're not including security into that uh, software, uh, into that lifecycle like we should be. Another issue, pre-baked threats. Uh, I've got a loaf of bread showing there. The reason I'm showing that is we're seeing mobile phones shipped with malware already installed on them. I'm not talking about the bloatware that is on every phone or whatever, although that's bad too. I'm talking about mobile phones, computers, IoT devices, servers and workstations coming out of factories that have compromised firmware and compromised instructions baked into the hardware itself. Major issue. And this is reason why so many organizations from governments, UK government, for example, US government work real hard to use trusted providers so that they can say we don't have compromised firmware or we don't have compromised hardware with the instructions baked right into the chips. That still seems to be happening. Another major things that's ha thing that's happening nowadays, and it goes back to a bit to the kind of Secondary point I was making about today's hackers, it, credential harvesting. Let's put it this way. It used to be the hacker would go through a life cycle. If they got a hold of uh, Kelly or Bucks or my uh, 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 user credentials, then they would hack into my system or they would hack into Kelly's system or hack into Bucks. You, you get the idea. Well, what's happening now is these organizations are going, well, you know, it's a lot less risk for us to grab James's confidential information and credentials, username, passwords, associated information, and then sell it on the market. That way they can broker it they, and it's low risk and there's higher reward. Well, I can get money right away and sell this information on the dark web and then I'm out of the equation. Let the other person who's far better than me at breaking into things take that information and then exploit it. So what we're seeing is whole gangs of people doing credential harvesting. They're stealing authentication information, usernames, passwords, and in some cases, it's just as important, if not more important, associated information. They're going through public documents and then they are doing big data analysis and finding out, hmm, we've gathered all of this seeming unimportant, unrelated data about James Stanger, and we're we basically have done a Google-like big data analysis, and here's where we think he's going. Here's what he does. Here are the types of patterns. And they can sell that information because that's like marketing information. Good marketers do the same thing so that they can position products to sell to me, right? That's what Amazon's all about and Google and you get the idea. Hackers are doing the same thing and they're very sophisticated at it. So in, in many ways, credential harvesting is kind of the third most popular attack. The reason I state that is that uh, the first most popular attack still seems to be things like ransomware, but credential harvesting has become very important. And so you use social engineering, you engage in pretexting, uh, pretexting meaning you come up with a story that's believable. And you fish me with it or you spear fish, meaning, you know, fishing is where you throw the net out and try to get a bunch of folks. Spear fishing is where you identify a specific person. If you're whaling, you go after somebody unlike me who has tons of money. Um, you try to get physical access to systems you, or even logical access. And so you're tricking individuals and groups of users. And this graphic here that you see here is an example. Of, it's a simple example, but it's the social engineering toolkit. Anybody who's capable of installing Kali Linux or Parrot Linux or whatever can use the social engineering toolkit. Um, uh, oftentimes the lame, uh, you know, oh, I'm, I'm stuck in X country types of hacks or I'm somebody who uh, needs a bank draft right away, they'll use social engineering toolkit to create those lame tools. Uh, but some people will use social engineering toolkit to create very, very convincing 
uh, social engineering attacks that create web pages that look exactly like a Facebook page or exactly like a browser update page. That's very difficult to tell the difference. So in this case, this is an old example, but an old example of Facebook where it looks like Facebook. It even has a good uh, uh, image URL, the whole nine yards, but it is a fake page. And it basically is where people install that malware. Here's another example of somebody who created the Amazon uh, a page uh, using social engineering toolkit or a similar tool and uh, they're a basically able to go in and what I'm noticing what I'm showing you here is uh, the simple host file or the LM host file uh, all you have to do to get physical as get physical access to somebody's system and type in a fake mapping of an IP address to a fake server and it'll look to the user, hey, look, yeah, I'm going to Facebook like I do every day. But in fact, it's your own system. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the hacker system. And the hacker can make that system look like a Facebook page or Twitter or what have you, and then start credential, uh, credential harvesting and getting information. That's a simple technique. There are more sophisticated techniques, but the whole idea is essentially the same. The idea uh, is that um, I'm able to gain physical access to somebody's system. I do a simple change of a file, do a bogus mapping, uh, 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 address mapping, and suddenly that person thinks they're communicating with a legitimate system, and they're not. So in this case here, uh, I've begun editing uh, the host file uh, and to map it to Facebook, and I could replace that 0.0.0.0, .0, with <coughs> the IP address of a particular system. So this is these are techniques for credential harvesting. Uh, the advanced persistent threat concept has been around for a long time, folks. Um, it's still a major issue. It has to do with long-term infiltration, and I think you've noticed that one of the patterns of this presentation and, and uh, which of the hackers today is they're in it for the long haul. It used to be they did quick smash and grab. You know, oh look, I defaced a web page or I stole the the company. Uh, uh, credentials, or excuse me, I stole the credit cards or whatever. What's happening is we're seeing long-term planning over a period of months, weeks, months, uh, malware introduction over a period of just as long, uh, it, where they ex exert command and control and then start moving laterally through systems and identifying targets. This process is something that doesn't take hours or days. It takes weeks and months. They're very patient because they have multiple targets, hundreds of targets that they're going after, and they're doing it very slowly because the payoff can be huge. We've seen, for example, with uh, the Facebook attack, 50 million users' uh, logins uh, uh, being taken over. We've seen the, uh, the hacks against the U.S. government that have been so successful, Equifax. The whole idea is that the advanced persistent threat, it does require significant reconnaissance, good discovery skills, and highly skilled individuals. Traditionally, they were state-sponsored. They were run by whatever government. You want to uh, you, you wanna name the bad, whatever bad guy government you can think of, uh, uh, both inside and outside the U.S., you get the idea. But uh, today, I would argue you don't have to have state-sponsored uh, hackers to do these types of attacks. There's been a lot of software that's been released over the uh, last few years, uh, the NSA release, for example. A lot of people have access to very powerful tools. And these gangs of uh, non-state sponsored uh, gangs are going around doing the same thing. Sometimes these gangs started working for a government, that contract came to an end, and those gangs still go, well, hey, we're we got the band together. Why not continue on the road? Well, instead of being sponsored by Miller Beer or you know whatever big uh, 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 government, we'll just sponsor ourselves and go get them. Uh, so the idea is they go after end users. Uh, they go after weak authentication. They go after endpoints, uh, systems that aren't being monitored properly. Okay. Uh, when I say no practical monitoring, they may have intrusion detection going. They may have um, a SIM tool, S-I-E-M tool uh, going, but it's not practically implemented properly. So this is still a major, major threat. Denial of service attacks and distributed denial of service attacks are still very big. Uh, uh, we've seen, uh, I haven't seen a lot of uh, notice of these lately, but trust me, the companies are getting attacked by them for a couple of reasons. One, it distracts the 
uh, security workers. So they go after the denial of service attack, distributed denial of service attack, and then the attackers uh, uh, basically do something else while the security workers are distracted. Uh, you also see it as part of a ransom sort of thing. We'll stop attacking your systems if you, company, stop doing what you're doing or if you pay us things. Social engineering remains the, the primary problem across the board. Uh, uh, yes, configuration issues do exist. Uh, um, uh, that Facebook attack went after the zero auth uh, protocol, uh, an improper implementation of it. But we're still finding that most attacks, the majority, at least 60% of attacks are happening through edge users. But I would argue one of the biggest threats to risk management today is not so much all of these types of threats, it's us focusing on the defender's dilemma and spending money on the wrong controls. We are not able to get, as security professionals, proper funding. And as a result, we get lack of trust with the board because hacks keep happening even though the board is spending money or the CEO is spending money. Or the CIO says, well, I, she just says I'm spending money, but I, I'm not seeing the benefit. I'm not seeing what usually people will say, their ROI, the return on investment. So what happens is you've got third-party reviews and you hire cyber services and there are project funding reviews and, and there's always something lacking. And so is there a way out, like, you know, with Morpheus? Is, you know, he shows you the red pill, the blue pill. Which one will you take? Now, there's no one pill that's going to get us out of this. But going from Morpheus to somebody who is decidedly less cool than Morpheus, Dwight David Eisenhower. Let's see if we can actually do something here and talk about how we can work our way kind of into an area where we can apply our con security controls better um, and, and get better funding and so that we can help defend ourselves out of this particular um, set of on this, this onslaught of advanced persistent threats, of fileless threats, of ransomware, et cetera, crypto malware. Dwight Eisenhower, when he left the presidency, said basically, and there's a quote here, you can read it, uh, saying there's a lot of misplaced power that can happen. Um, there's too much uh, power from the military industrial complex. I don't want to get all morpheus -y here or, or tinfoil hat or whatever. But my point is not so much, you know, there's power in the wrong areas. My point is, as cybersecurity professionals, we are spending a ton of money. OK, this is just one report by 2020, $101.6 billion on cybersecurity was 73 billion in, in 2016. So you have a 37 percent increase. Uh, the, the U.S. federal government alone spending, say, $28 billion. That's a lot of money. Uh, is it being applied correctly? So it's not so much, oh, there's evil people or, or whatever. What I am saying is. Can we, as cybersecurity professionals, find a way kind of out of this, this mess by applying security controls in a better way? So let's get a little deeper into the problems, then I'll show you some solutions. We did some surveying over uh, at CompTIA, and we basically asked, uh, you know, how is your current security? And notice 23% said, hey, we're pretty happy with what we got. 56% said they're pretty happy with it. I, it's nice to feel confident, but I would argue that in the face of a lot of the hacks that have been going on, um, I would be worried. The average company still is not up to speed in getting their cybersecurity profile correctly. Let me explain why I say that. We asked, hey, where are, is your security function located? In other words, where do your security workers report up to? And obviously, everybody would report up to the senior director, uh, the director of a nonprofit, or to the CEO of a company, get the idea. But notice the security team seems to still be reporting to the infrastructure team. Now, the reason I think that's a, a, a bit of a scary idea, folks, is that you really don't want your IT team, who are responsible for providing the services, to be over the security team. The security team is more interested in keeping data private, is more interested in making sure that data and information is, and that systems communicate securely. Um, and so they really both should not report up through the same person like the CIO. The security team could report through uh, a, a dedicated CISO who then goes uh, reports either to the board or to the CEO. Uh, sometimes the security team, I've seen them 
a report through the accountant, believe it or not, through the through the uh, through the CFO. The idea is that you need separation or segregation of duties. We're not seeing that. So if you're happy with your security scene and you're not doing separation of duties, already you have a problem. We're seeing that companies do use metrics, measurements to, to track security efforts. We do see them set it. But notice many of them will set it. 73% of the IT function will set metrics, but then the review is less usually. Some business units do a better job, but what we find is that there is moderate to heavy use of metrics, but oftentimes if they're not followed through. So we do see that companies do compliance audits. That's like a pen test. Uh, systems uh, will be patched, we get the idea. There's formal risk assessments that are going on, that's great. But many times, they are not properly tracked. So we set the metrics, but then we really don't ne truly go back and see, well, 30 days from now, what's happened? Because people do not have enough resources, there's also insufficient skill. We're seeing a major skills gap uh, in, uh, in the, across the world here at CompTIA uh, in regards to cybersecurity. There aren't people enough to do it. Uh, therefore, there's uncertainty. Well, which metrics are more important than others? Well, a lot of this is compounded by the concept that I mentioned earlier of the defender's dilemma. It's a classic IT approach, and it's the idea that, well, if if just one hacker gets through, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? So you focus on what that one hacker might be able to do to you. Uh, so you focus on the systems being defended or what the hacker's doing, maybe. Uh, I mean, excuse me, on the, what the defender can do. You focus on stopping the attack rather than managing it. And it is effective to a point. Fear is always a great motivator. Uh, but really, Boards and executives don't want to invest in one-off solutions or, uh, or things. Uh, and the reason I have a car there, that's a, uh, uh, a Land Rover Defender, very expensive car one day. Uh, I'd love to own one. Good luck with, for me, to me. I think it's time to move from the defender's dilemma to a more useful approach, the hacker's dilemma. And this is something, there's a gentleman at Microsoft who came up with this term. Uh, I had a friend of mine over at Target uh, Who's, uh, who's, who's done a great job cleaning up that, what happened over there. Um, and he was talking about, it's more useful to talk about the hacker's dilemma. And Tim told me that it's better to focus on the steps that the hacker takes. So with each step along the way, how can you track the hacker and trace what they're doing and map and correlate activities of the hacker and create actions to counter what the hacker's doing and then measure success that way? They could say, well, James, yeah, that's a standard thing. Trust me, I've gone uh, basically around the world, and most companies have not made this pivot, focusing from the hack, uh, defender's dilemma to the hacker's dilemma. They have not moved and the, uh, over to mapping controls to indicators of compromise. So what are the tactics or procedures and the tools, techniques and procedures to put the hacker's dilemma to work? And this is where you have to think of in terms of something called Lockard's exchange principle. And Lockard was a French guy, I think, who lived, uh, I think died what, maybe 1960s or something like that. Basically a detective. And he said, basically, the perpetrator of a crime will bring something to the crime scene and then leave something behind. And this is an essential concept for metrics, believe it or not. And people might say, well, metrics are usually, you know, have we applied patches or have we, you know, done pen tests? Mm -mm. You have to focus on the specific steps of the hacker. So wh uh, what you need to do is it helps you map security controls to these indicators of compromise. And, and it helps you really move towards a, uh, an ROI sort of perspective. Let me get, let me show you. So you take a look at essential resources, uh, the end users, the end points, which is really where a lot of things are, a lot of attacks are happening to the processes, and it allows you to focus on those systems and the right uh, interstices, that's a word that I use, um, basically the way in which different processes work with each other. We're noticing that end users are getting attacked, okay? So that's the interstice there is where an end user inter interacts with email or with IM or with a web server. An another example of an interstice is where one technology combines with another uh, or works with another. For example, uh, Facebook a, a couple of years ago was using SMS to uh, send passwords. Well, problem is the SMS protocol, what we use for texting, 
is by default not not encrypted. You don't want to send passwords across an unencrypted channel. People were able to get in to people's passwords that way. So using Lockhart's exchange principle, the idea that the perpetrator will leave something behind or whatever is the reason why you have a red team and a blue team in the first place. A red team folks are the pen testers. They're the hackers, uh, the good guy hackers, whatever. For years, I've noticed people will run these tests kind of to run them. Oh yeah, we uh, did an, a security analyst, uh, I sorry, we did a pen test here and all that. And that's fine, but it kind of leads to a whack-a-mole sort of approach. Why are you doing the pen test in the first place? And the quick answer is to improve the ability of the security analysts to listen in and find out what the hackers are doing. These teams work together to create uh, um, useful metrics and act upon them. That's why you do a pen test. It's a major reason why you do it. I'll use a quick example. Some of you may have seen an old movie called The Hunt for Red October. It's a old submarine movie with Sean Connery, blah, blah, blah. I can't remember when it came out, sometime in the 90s, I think. Um, in it, I won't go too much into detail here, but in it, uh, the captain was basically, you know, looking around to see if he can find this, uh, this, su this Russian submarine. And Jonesy, this uh, a gentleman, says, look, I thought there was uh, a magma displacement or it looked like it was something that, you know, was an act of nature but it really actually was the submarine. So he was able to figure out what that submarine sounds like. What does this have to do with the price of tea in China? What does it have to do with the uh, cybersecurity? Well, just about everything. Jonesy is a person who listens for anomalies. He listens for problems. And even though the computers may have told him, oh yeah, that's not really a problem. He was smart enough to tell the difference between an engine plant, an engine working, right? An engine operating and something that looked natural. It's the same sort of thing with red team and blue team. They basically work together uh, to do a root cause analysis to see what are the problems that are happening in my particular network. If 60% of the ve vectors, the bad guys, come through the end user, through web browser attacks, through business email compromises, and these types of things, we need to shift our thinking, maybe protect endpoints, and to take a look at that chatter. Uh, the privilege and 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 we need to implement new technologies of privileged access management of malware monitoring services to search these interests these these interactions between end users and see if we can tell the difference between what is a natural part of networking and what is an actual attack so there are all sorts of ways in which we can improve our security folks um, traditionally, we focused on the perimeter. When I say traditionally, up until the last five years, um, the firewall was everything. It, it, we borrowed it from military circles, maybe even from architecture, the idea of a firewall sitting between uh, one building and another. If, if one building burns down, a firewall helps protect it to the other building. You get the idea. It's based on inside and outside. It's a very hardware-based model. Uh, um, it is based on the firewall. Uh, intrusion is part of that. Well, inside and outside. Intrusion meaning somebody coming in. Well, today, folks, with the advent uh, of the cloud, and the cloud has been implemented truly over the last several years. It's been around a long time, 10 more years, but cloud computing has really been implemented in earnest the last three or year, years or so. We're seeing the fact that there's no longer that perimeter anymore, right? I mean, your systems are in the cloud. That means they're not in that physical perimeter in that physical building anymore. They're probably down in a data center in Prineville somewhere, Oregon, or, or somewhere in North or, North or South Carolina. So you can't focus on that location-based approach anymore. What can you focus on? Well, identity, where the data is. So instead of focusing on the firewall, inside and outside, or variations of whitelisting where you deny all and, and allow some in, you need to take some different perspectives. And, and so some of the security solutions that are, are you know, big right now is finding ways to do air gaps, to isolate networks more. You know, does that network really need to be connected to the internet the whole time uh, or even at all? We're seeing a lot of increased monitoring services, 24 by seven monitoring services. Multi-factor authentication. In fact, I'm doing a webinar here at the end of uh, October for CompTIA on implementing multi-factor authentication in Linux systems. It's a practical webinar. We're actually going to implement 
um, multi-factor authentication for secure shell to secure your systems. Micro segmentation, perimeterless models, uh, sometimes called the software defined perimeter. Uh, there are models that instead of thinking of in terms of intrusion inside and outside, they think in terms of lateral movement, east or west movement, as it were. Um, uh, we're seeing a lot of cloud access security brokers and endpoint detection response. These are all very useful um, solutions for the security operations center. Uh, they uh, basically through, say, software defined perimeter, the idea is that you are in, in invoking a lot more security controls in between your data and the user so that you can search what the user is doing, those interstices, more easily. So multi-factor authentication, what you have, what you know, what you are, using that in, in a much more sophisticated way is, is very important. And this is a very, it's not a magic bullet. Uh, none of these things I've listed are magic bullets, but they are all very important ways in which you can invoke, multi, uh, invoke uh, uh, something you have, something you know, something you are, and make uh, a lot of the services that you have created more secure doesn't solve anything, but it helps raise the bar. None of these will work though, unless you properly have metrics, and unless you properly use the red team and blue team together to just to help justify why you're doing things like multi-factor authentication. We're seeing credential harvesting as a big problem. Well, end user education is a big deal. Uh, it is important to help people think before they click. We also need uh, IT folks to understand the devices better, to understand the underlying protocols. End users need to know that too, uh, but also IT professionals. Regular uh, password changing, yeah. Multi-factor authentication, using proper passwords. The same kind of story, sure, but multi-factor authentication is a big change that can really help a lot of things. It can help uh, in a, uh, move the needle a little bit. Backup is a huge deal. Uh, as I was talking about earlier, I was talking to the CISO of, over at Colorado, and she was talking about how if she, uh, she was down for several weeks, couple weeks, uh, a lot of her systems, she, she was saying she may never have gotten her systems back, and, and it would have taken a year or, uh, or so to get her systems back up if she hadn't backed up properly. And it is the primary defense against ransomware, crypto malware, even DDoS attacks. It's not somebody else's job and it's yours. You need to learn about how this works. Uh, uh, I've often, as I've traveled around the world, a lot of people will say, you know, kids these days, they think backup just happens automatically. Um, well, uh, you know, you could argue from an end user perspective, I guess it does in a certain level, but not on a business. So good backup, that's a major skill that you need to learn. So, so take the steps to become a backup king or queen okay, to become a backup expert. When it comes to organizing uh, um, cybersecurity, even the best backup strategy, even the best uh, intrusion detection or user management or, or privileged access user management strategy will fail unless the industry properly, or unless the company properly implements it. And that means it has to be part of a security policy, it has to be part of its metrics. And these metrics can't come from, can't come from governments. These metrics can't come from software companies. They can't even come from uh, really smart security workers. They have to come from experience derived and uh, from the actual organization. Uh, that's basically, you need a red team and a blue team to work together to come up with an understanding of how your network behaves. Uh, of where the risks are. So you need those teams to start asking questions. The security analysts will start asking questions about, well, where does the data reside? And what kind of security controls exist in the first place? Where are the crown jewels of the organization? Is it, uh, if you're Google, the crown jewels really are in the data that you're able to uh, crunch and turn into actionable information. Uh, if you're a bank, the data, uh, may be less important, the actual obvious inf uh, important information, financial accounts, the actual accounts. So you apply your security controls appropriately. If you're a bank, you can apply your security controls differently than the, um, uh, than say an organization such as Google. Uh, 
So you have to get your metrics from the right organism, uh, from your own experience. And you have to think of limiting factors. So, for example, uh, this here is something I, I got from a, a, a uh, from, an, from an organization. This is a particular set of metrics that he put together. And these are terms that have been used in the industry, folks, for years. The concept of a compromise and dwell time. That means, uh, means something has failed. There's some sort of uh, rat, as it were, uh, as, as my friend put it, that's been let loose on a system. And then there's a t uh, uh, dwell time, there's a lag between when that compromise happened and the detection. And then there's containment time where you collect and validate inf information, and then you implement a solution, and then you have containment. Then he uses the term exposure time to explain all of that. It's kind of the big, larger category. The reason I've taken so much time to explain this, folks, is that he uses these terms consistently throughout his intrusion detection systems, throughout his SIM tools, throughout his and all of his security controls. Why does he do that? Because he helped create those terms in his organization and apply those terms in a systematic way through the red team and the blue team working together. And he took into consideration various limiting factors, basically one against one factor, uh, which is where the security person says, hey, you've got ransomware on that uh, system. You can't use it anymore. Uh, and this is, uh, here's a real example. But the uh, uh, the oil rig in the uh, uh, North Sea basically says, well, I realize that system has been compromised, if not by ransomware, but by uh, some really bad software. I can't take that system offline because it is controlling the pipeline that is delivering oil into the mainland. I can't just shut that down. So you have one person saying, I can't shut it down. Another person saying, shut it down. The idea here is that, that you try to lo lower the exposure time or the dwell time, the containment time, as low as you can. But there are various factors that make it so you can't. And oftentimes they'll say, yeah, I realize there's bad malware happening there, but the show must go on. We'll find another way to, to handle it. So normally we just turn the system off or pull the plug or whatever, but we can't. There's also the 50 to 1. Uh, I was talking to a, an organization that said, yeah, this, these metrics are all great, James, or the, this idea of using consistent terms is great, but there's really only about one out of 50 organizations that have the ability to do that. There's another factor called the 14 plus factor, and it's the whole concept of service contracts. Um, if you're a big organization, you are usually outsourcing a lot of your uh, IT work. And as part of that, there are statements of work and there are uh, uh, service level agreements that have been created. And those service level agreements often will say, well, we will get to, if you say that there's a problem, got to work on it right away, we will use X number of hours, uh, we will take X number of hours to respond to that. If we take longer than that, then, uh, you know, it's, it's on us and we've messed up. But a lot of times uh, there's one company that said, uh, if there's an issue, we can take up to 14 days to address it. So you may have noticed a compromise and you may have noticed that you can detect it in you know, a day or in two hours. But the company that is over that by contract would say, well, I've got 14 days to address it. So you may say, and this is why you see a lot of uh, factors, a lot of uh, uh, hacks that have been in systems for 45 days, 85 days, 100, you get the idea, uh, because a lot of times there are contractors who just can't get to things as quickly or don't get to things as quickly as they can. So everybody wants or expects root and administrative access, but you find that that cannot be handed out willy-nilly. And so because people don't have root access to do things to handle a detection or to start collecting information right or to validate information, there's a window of opportunity that hackers have. Sometimes it's just 15 seconds between uh, uh, the actual attack and what the uh, antivirus is able to respond with. Uh, sometimes it's 15 seconds plus 14 days or more. So here are some considerations. You map the software and service purchases to meaningful terms and metrics. And by meaningful terms and metrics, I mean things that have been set up not by, oh, yeah, we're using uh, some sort of security standard, an ISO standard or whatever. You have to come up with them yourself. And you can't just check the box or adopt a framework or the latest technology. The way to breathe easier during the next uh, audit to truly risk manage, manage risk, excuse me, is to 
use the red team and the blue team and to do these types of activities. There's no magic bullet, okay? But that that relationship, I call it, call it the heuristic relationship, meaning circular in a good way, where the red team goes in, conducts searches, and then the blue team listens carefully. And then they're like, okay, here's what we need to do to, what we need to do to protect our systems. So we're seeing the Russian grid attacks. We're seeing the Under Armour attack, Facebook. It's not just social engineering. That was a, a serious flaw in the, uh, as far as what we know, serious flaw in the zero off uh, implementation that Facebook did here for that 50 million plus users. British Air, where partners can uh, hurt you. Ticketmaster, where in their response, where partners can help. Uh, we find that these, the lessons learned uh, are different from company to company. But what we're finding is that through all of these attacks, if we're able to simulate attacks and then listen to them carefully using security analytics, you can go a long way to help secure your company. So today, folks, I've talked about uh, a bit about the attack landscape, about moving from the defender's dilemma to the attacker's dilemma. And that's Mount Fielson, by the way, in, uh, in Oregon. I was able to hike around that. It was a lot of fun. Um, and also how you can improve your detection and response methodologies through separation of duties. That's an old concept, but through using and applying consistent measurement metrics, not taken from uh, abstract frameworks or recommendations, but from your own network's experience. So this concludes the formal presentation. Uh, I'm curious if anybody has any uh, questions. Uh, happy to, uh, to answer them at this time. Thank you. Uh, you bet. Sorry, and Gene. While we're doing, no problem. While we're doing questions, uh, these are a few uh, articles that I've uh, written or been in, uh, been quoted in, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, the copy of the slide deck will be made available, I think. So uh, uh, happy to answer any questions that folks have. Thank you so much, James. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to type those in now. We will stay on the line for the next few minutes and have James address those um, over audio. I also wanted to remind you all that it is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So with that, New Horizons is running complimentary webinars for you all all month long. So be sure to, this was the first in our webinar series, so be sure to visit our website at newhorizons.com. Click on the webinars link and you'll be able to sign up for all of our upcoming sessions that you wish. You can also view uh, past webinar recordings in our archive library. And once again, those are complimentary to you. Um, as a reminder, I will send you all a copy of this slide deck so you will have the links to all of those latest articles and blog entries that you see on the screen now. I will also be sending you a link to view the session recording or you can pass it on to any colleagues who were unable to join us. And I think we can go ahead and wrap things up, James. It looks like we don't have any questions. So thank you again so much for joining us and uh, speaking on behalf of CompTIA and New Horizons. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Everybody take care. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us. I hope you'll join us for future webinars. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks, Kelly. Bye-bye.